Yes, it is. And I'm really excited about my guest today. I'll tell you what, Roger Lajoie. It's kind of a media day at lunch. I had Gene Principe and Joe Piscucci from our old days with CKND Sportsline. We talked a little bit about the Oilers, of course. Uh, Gene and I go way back from my days in Winnipeg. He did a lot of charity work with me, so I was really honored to have him on. And now to have Roger Lajoie. Uh, not only an incredible author, uh, he's Mr. Media to me. He knows everything about the media, uh, whether it be sports, marketing, or teaching. Uh, Roger has done it all and seen it all, so we're blessed to have him. And he's also the official scorer for the Blue Jays. And I think this is going to be an exciting year for the Blue Jays, so we'll get his take on it. And then, of course, Paul Rosen from the Rosen Report will be joining us, and they'll be telling you about something that's really cool. And all the way from Argentina, Matthew Meisner, thank you for joining us. Don't forget, Fan Friday. You're on it, kid, and we're really excited about that. Hey, listen, I'm not going to go into a long spin of uh, a monologue here. I've got Roger Roger Lajoie on. Let's go right to him uh, with his new book. It is Roger La joie. Roger, how are you? Nice to see you. I'm great, sir. Thank you. Nice to be with you. It's always a pleasure to have you. I think uh, I had, I think uh, you may, I'm sure you know both of them, uh, specifically, uh, obviously, Gene Principe out in Oilerland. And Joe Piscucci comes from Winnipeg. He was part of the CKND sports line. I think there was a sports line here, if I'm not mistaken. And then Joe is now living in Toronto, doing some research at the Hockey Hall of Fame. Uh, so it's kind of media day, but to have you to end the day off, I'll tell you what, we're we're really excited because uh, I know that uh, we're going to talk a little hockey. We have to talk baseball, of course, books. Uh, you've written several of them, and we'll get into that, obviously, with your new book. Let's dig into it right off the bat, get it into the Winnipeg Jets are playing the Toronto Maple Leafs tonight, the North Division. I know there's a lot of feelings that the North isn't as strong as the East, the West, the Central, and any other ones that they want to throw at it. I don't believe that. I think until the games are played, we don't know, but I certainly see a lot of promise in the Winnipeg Jets, in the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, I like the Edmonton Oilers. Also, I think Montreal is going to be that that team that may surprise us. Love to hear your take on it. Well, Kerry, uh, you know, you're right. We will not know uh, how the uh, Canadian Northern Division, whatever you want to call it, uh, matches up against the other divisions in the NHL until they play. Uh, it's a very unique season this year. And maybe some of the results we're seeing are warped as a result. But we can use the word maybe over and over again because it really is just a, a maybe. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit in terms of how good I think the Canadian division has been just from watching, because that's the only uh, barometer we have. We have not seen the other divisions. I watch a lot of hockey uh, throughout uh, the course of a, a week, like a lot of people do, I suppose, these days. And I, I, I think Tampa Bay, Boston, Vegas, uh, Colorado, um, my goodness, I, there's, there's a lot of hockey teams I think are superior to the Canadian division teams, but we won't know until it comes up. Um, that said, the grouping is very tight. I don't think it should be, to be honest with you. I, I think the Toronto Maple Leafs have kind of squandered a, an opportunity to separate themselves from the pack a little bit. Of the other teams in the division, I like the Winnipeg Jets a lot. But frankly, I don't think anyone else in the division is that much of a threat. Uh, I, I don't think Montreal has enough skill up front. I think they're, um, they're a, a bigger team. They play heavier. Uh, when price is hot, they're obviously they're still a dangerous opponent. Don't get me wrong, but I don't see them as anything near a terrific team. Edmonton appears still to be flawed to me. You just look at them and you realize something is missing. And Calgary and Vancouver and Ottawa, quite frankly, I don't think any of those three teams are any good. Uh, Ottawa's got an excuse because they're in a massive rebuild. And actually, I kind of like their jam. Uh, Vancouver and Calgary don't really impress me. So, you know, we, we'll, we'll find out. Because four of them will play in the first round of the playoffs, and one of them is going to the Stanley Cup semifinal. And that, this year, will provide whoever that is with the best chance they're going to have to win the Stanley Cup 
uh, maybe since 1993 when Montreal won the Stanley Cup. So um, we shall see what happens. And I look forward to tonight's game. And I think the Jets and the Leafs, that's that's one, two in the division. Yeah, so obviously when we look at the uh, Winnipeg Jets, uh, we look at their top nine pretty good. Same with the Leafs. And now it's just the goaltending question, of course, in, in uh, Toronto. You know, obviously Campbell's in tonight. We don't know what's going on with Anderson. In Winnipeg, you know what? Hellerbach is seeming to look like that Vesna winner from old. But, again, he's had an up-and-down year. So I think that's going to really determine those two who goes one and two. And I agree with you, Edmonton. I just don't think they're there. I think they got a one-two punch like no other. But I think the rest of the team, other than Nurse, I was really impressed with what Darnell Nurse has, Nurse has done. He's come up and being a leader on that defensive core for Edmonton. But I think it's Toronto and and Winnipeg, and we'll see that tonight. Uh, of course, you are the official scorer for the Blue Jays. Tell me how excited you must be. Tomorrow it all starts off. There's been a little bit of, I wouldn't say controversy, but obviously with Springer being hurt and some of the injuries that have gone through uh, spring training, it still looks like a heck of a ball club. I, I always do a caveat. I'm not the I'm not the most knowledgeable Blue Jay uh, fan. I, I promise uh, Paul uh, and Warren Saku to learn more about it. I love the game, uh, but I'd love to hear it from the guy that scores for them. What are we looking at? Well, first, uh, thank you for that, Kerry. I'm one of the official scores I want to point out for the Blue Jays. There are three of us, and all three of us who do it, uh, we split the gig, 27 games each. We all always say there's three of us because if you don't like our call, then we can blame the other guy, and it was his night. <laughs> Nobody knows who's scoring, and that's just kind of half kidding there. It's an honor to be an official scorer in, in Major League Baseball. It's my 10th season with the Blue Jays, and I'm uh, very excited about it. We have a particular challenge here in Toronto, as I think everyone would realize, and although maybe people don't realize the other uh, state of affairs, the way things are going in America right now. So last year, of course, because of COVID, it was a shortened season, and we remotely scored all the games. There were no official scorers who were actually in the ballpark for obvious reasons. Uh, so we watched on monitors. We had several camera angles. We uh, had all we had to do it remotely, just like most of the play-by-play -play crews had to. So it made it much more challenging. This year, uh, every other official scorer in Major League Baseball will be back in the ballpark starting tomorrow at Yankee Stadium. Every team in the United States will have uh, attendance of between 20 to 30 percent, 20 to 50 percent, I believe it is. And uh, in some cases, the Texas Rangers, I think foolishly, are actually selling all their tickets for the home opener. Uh, I won't comment on that. I don't want to get into that. But they're, they're the official scores and all the other uh, centers are back to normal. They're back in the ballpark, they're watching from their seat, and they're doing it. We, once again, will be based here in Toronto, watching the games remotely. So, Kerry, I'm very excited. I always look forward to it. I love being an official scorer, but full disclosure, it is a, it's a very tough job at the best of times, and remote scoring is not the best of times. So um, you, we got to be ready. It's going to be in a special challenge. As far as the ball club goes... I think the ball club has a chance to be terrific. I think their lineup one to nine is frightening. If I am a starting pitcher on another team, I'm not sleeping too well the night before I have to face the Blue Jays. Reminds me of that 15-16 team with uh, Edwin and uh, and uh, Batista and Donaldson. It's like it has the potential to be as scary. I'm very concerned about their pitching. I don't think their pitching is good enough. And baseball is pitching. Uh, hockey is goaltending. So until that pitching, either maybe some of the younger pitchers are better than we thought, uh, maybe a couple of guys have career years, I'm not prepared to anoint a fantastic season this year. But I think the Blue Jays are, at the worst, the second best team in the division, at the worst, a playoff contender, and the potential uh, for a great season is very much there. And we'll see if they can uh, add and improve on that pitching staff sometime before the trade deadline. Because, Kerry, I think if they're really going to be a factor this year, I think they're going to have to. Hey, listen, you know what? Before uh, we get into your books, I, I want to bring Paul up because he is Mr. Baseball to me. Uh, so let's have Paul Rosen. Rosie join us. Hey, Rosie, what's going on? Not much. We uh, 
It's always, always a pleasure and an honor to uh, get to talk to Roger. He What, you can't keep me on the show? What? I mean, no, because I, you say it was an honor, you stop talking. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's always, my tooth. I pushed the wrong button. Sorry about I, that. I shouldn't have touched it. Jordan. Always, before Roger and I got together for the book, I always respected uh, Roger like crazy, watched almost everything he did. And then to get a chance to uh, uh, spend the time that we spent together on the book and um, become friends, uh, it's nothing nothing's better than uh, being on the show with him yeah very nice rosie thank you feeling hey, is listen i wanted i wanted to get into baseball just a little bit more because obviously it's opening day and i was watching a program last night and watching you know down the states how they do the opening days and they got the kids and 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 the wagons with their bat and the ball and the glove and dads you know either carrying one kid to the ballpark with their hats and jerseys Obviously, it's going to be a little bit different this year, and Blue Jay fans are again are not going to be able to do that. The only, the only, I'd like to hear you two chat a little bit about the Blue Jays, just to give our our listeners a little bit of an understanding of what we expect tomorrow. The one thing that I do know, I, I followed this one because you mentioned pitching. I did want to ask you, Roger, specifically about the Kirby Yates story. Obviously, they they gambled and they took on a pitcher that did we knew had some issues with the arm. They didn't overpay as as every you know five million bucks. I think it's overpaid, but they they gambled and lost. Do you do you look at the management and saying, "Hey guys, what have you done here?" Or was that a legitimate good gamble? But unfortunately, sometimes when you gamble, you lose. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, there no criticism from my standpoint on, on Kirby Yates, uh, Kerry and Paul. Um, listen, one thing, you know, we all like to, especially in this day and age now where sports has become so uh, preoccupied and dominated by gambling and who's going to win. And before we even talk about a game, the first thing anybody says is who you got. And my answer is usually, I don't know. I've been watching sports for years and I don't know who's going to win. And I don't know how anybody else thinks they know who's going to win. And here's one thing you can definitely not predict, even if you think you can predict <laughs> the result of sports, is injuries. Yes, some players are more prone to injury than others, without question. Is there a certain amount of risk when you go out and, uh, and sign a player who has a, a history of injuries? For sure. But they're not stupid either. A lot of money is invested. Doctors check them out. They're confident it's going to be okay. And when it's not, in retrospect, I think it's easy to sit on the couch and say, well, why'd you sign that guy? He got hurt. Uh, I think any time a team takes the challenge, the gamble, if you want to call it, and invests money in improving their team, I'm going to give them a break. Uh, nobody can predict an injury. Nobody knows that's going to happen. And even if you've been hurt all the time, who's to say what you're going to be like this year? So I don't see anything wrong with it. Major disappointment, though. And a major turn for this team's pitching staff because now it looks like they're going to do a closer by committee. And I can tell you, I don't know how you feel about it, Rosie, but I don't like closer by committee. I, I'd, I'd rather have a guy at the back of my bullpen that, you know, I'm pretty confident and he knows he's getting the ball most of the time. Maybe that role will evolve eventually throughout the course of the season. But Yates, I don't criticize the signing, but his injury is, I think, devastating for the team, Paul. I agree with you 100%. And I think uh, management, they had it locked in that Yates was going to be that nine in, ninth inning guy. And that's critical because, you know, if you can get six out of your starter, which is, you know, hardly happens anymore, then you only have to worry about seven and eight and six and a bit, seven and eight. And then you have bang, you have your ninth inning guy. Now, I heard that they're going to go with Romano to start as the closer potentially. I don't know whether that'll work uh, because he's not really proven, but uh, that would be nice to see a hometown guy. I wanted to ask you what you thought about the infield. I am really high on this Blue Jays infield. They look extremely solid. Oh, there's no doubt, Paul. Right around from, from first to third base, the Blue Jays have a lot. Seminen was a fantastic addition. People yeah. forget about the kind of bat he's got in addition uh, to his offense. We know what Vladdy can do. We know what Biggio can do. We know what Bichette can do. I mean, there is just so much talent. There's a plethora of outfielders now as well with Springer being added to the lineup. And again, Paul, as I mentioned when I was talking to, to Gooch at the start of the show, you look at the lineup, one to nine. Yep. My goodness, there's there's not very many soft spots. Yeah, all right. I mean, Danny Jansen's catching. You can pitch around a guy or two. 
but not very many. It's one after another. And in, in terms of like, you know, the, the middle of the infield and throughout this uh, lineup, I see no weak spots. And that's why you're encouraged because let's face it, some years, you know, you look at it and you go, geez, I'm a little worried about outfield or I'm a little worried. I'm a little worried about pitching. I don't have any concerns about infield. I don't have any concerns about outfield. I don't have any in uh, concerns about organizational depth as well. They, they have they have a lot of ball players who are going to get an opportunity to play. And as far as Romano and, and closing goes, Rosie, I don't think there's any doubt. And not only he, look, if somebody can just definitively show that they want to be the guy in the ninth inning, I think every manager would rather have a guy back there. But that said, especially this day and age, sometimes, Paul, as you know, you watch a lot of baseball, the save is in the sixth inning. Yep. The save is in the seventh inning. You come in the seventh inning, it's 3-2. And then you guys score four runs in the eighth, and you don't have to worry about the ninth. Yep. Yep. So yep. I, I do see both sides of that. But, um, no, no concerns. Infield, position, one to nine, no worries at all. Pitching, um, I, I got to wait and see. I agree with you 100%. Hey, I asked Warren Sockyu this on Monday. Um, you know, I, I love ball, and I've been watching it for years. And I, I love watching, like, kind of human interest stories. You, you see a guy, and then you go, he does not look like a ball player. So Alejandro Kirk, when's the last time you saw a catcher? And I think he goes at 5'7", 230, you know, maybe 5'8", but I don't even think he's that big. But uh, what's what's your thoughts on a kid? like? Because the pitching staff say they love – he handles a game great – uh, he's got an incredible bat. What, what do you think of him? Well, if there's anybody, uh, first of all, who can, uh, if there's a position to play in baseball, if you're short and stocky, it's catching. Uh, <laughs> and he does not have to, a catcher very rarely during the course of defensively now has to run or be mobile. I love it. It's a great story. I think catching more than anything else, Paul, is working with pitchers. And it's an element that's underrated. And it's underrated because uh, unlike baseball is a game of stats. It's all yeah. numbers. It's all stats. But you cannot show on a stat, on an Excel spreadsheet, the value a veteran catcher who works well with a young pitching staff brings in terms of settling down, what pitches to call, even if it's framing pitches, regardless of what it is. The, def the, the defensive work of a catcher is not statistically measurable, at least not as much as other positions. So it's a fabulous story. It's great. The players love them. And end of the day, if the pitching staff loves them, it's terrific. It does show, though, again, if there is one spot on the diamond that the Blue Jays are not really solidified in, it's catcher. Not taking away from Kirk, uh, but if, if there was a more of a frontline catcher, we might not be talking about him as much. But yeah. that said, I, I, I hope for good things for him. And how can you not cheer for a guy that looks like us. Hey. Yeah, I agree with you. Hey, Gooch, can I ask Roger one more question about baseball? His thoughts? Do you think Vladdy... The don't, press, don't press any buttons, Gooch, please. Yeah. Don't. don't press you're, any you're, buttons. You're, you're, you're muted, Gucci. Um, <laughs> do, you, uh, do you think, Vladdy, the weight loss is going to be as... Bit, like, there's a lot of people saying this could be Vladdy's year as long as they keep him away from third, in my opinion. You know, first, DH... Can this be the year of Vladdy because of the weight loss? Well, I don't know if it's because of the weight loss. First of all, can it be the year of Vladdy? Very much so. Um, listen, we've been hearing that he is uh, the number one prospect in baseball uh, for several years now uh, since he was really just basically a kid. So yeah. I don't think there's any question that the potential is still there. The excitement is still there. The defensive liability, yeah, there's there's no doubt about that. I, I, I prefer DH. It's his bat more than his love that I like. But, you know, as far as the weight goes, Paul, and, and I know it was well documented, I'll, I'll just say this about that, and especially, again, when it comes to baseball. Um, I don't think anybody really talked about David Ortiz's weight during his career, did they? You know, uh, when you're hitting, all of a sudden, nobody's paying attention to your belly. And David yeah. was a big guy, and who, who cares? He's yeah. one of the premier sluggers of his generation. Vladdy's first two years are not quite – as good as people expected. In fact, let's be honest, they weren't nearly as good as right. people expected. And what is everybody talking about? Always oh, fat. So I tell you what, I, I like the fact that he lost weight. Sure, he's more of an athlete. Maybe that makes him better a better defender. But I can guarantee you, Paul, if he puts weight back on and his average goes up to 350, 
We'll stop cares? talking about what he weighs and we'll just be looking at what he's doing on the field. But I have huge expectations for him. Hey, and I'll buy him hot dogs if he needs to gain weight to hit even better. So who cares? Thank you for that analogy. Hey, listen, guys, let's get into uh, obviously, Roger, you're more than just a pretty face. You're more than just a guy that's on the radio. We love what you've done with the fan. We love everything about uh, the, your passion for the games, but also you're an incredible author. And of course, we have a new book out uh, that's just come out. But before that, you've got The Goal of My Life, a memoir with, uh, of course, Paul Henderson, The Greatest Day Ever, which was another title. If I miss one, I'd love you to tell me about it. But I like this one, The Road to Hockey Town. And of course, Jimmy De Devolano, who I know uh, you know personally. Love to hear about how easy it is, obviously, with the new book, The Power of Teammates. Uh, how you've written these books, there's got you gotta have a formula, or is every book different? Do you just and how do you dream these things up? Like, how do you say? Jimmy Devolano, pretty easy to understand that. But now you've got the power of teammates, obviously the Paul Henderson memoirs too. How do you come up with it? Well, every and thank you, Kerry, for that. And Paul, thank you for showing the book. And Jordan, thank you for putting it up. It's much appreciated. Um, Kerry, every, every book project is different, um, even when you're doing biographies. Of the four that I have had published, and by the way, I've also ghostwritten some other books, and you don't know about them because that's what ghostwriters do. Their name does not appear on the title. But those four books are on my author's page on Amazon, and I'm very proud of them. And they were, they were very different. Paul Henderson and Jimmy Devolano were very different individuals, but it was long interviewing. It was a lot of research, uh, and it was a barrel of fun, and it was a tremendous project. Greatest Day Ever and the new one, The Power of Teammates, very, very different. How you dream them up, Terry, is that, you know, one of the things I found in business, whether it's sports or whatever it is you're trying to do, is you got to try to find a, a, a need and fill it. That, that's what it is. And I don't think there's ever been a time in our time together as humans on this planet where people need some help dealing with their life. And that was the power of teammates. Now, Greatest Day Ever, I wrote in 2014. It's a book of kind of a similar vein. But in 2021, I took my own advice. I, I tell people, because one of the other things I do is personal development coaching with uh, clients. And I started that in 2013. And in 2019, I, I kind of just reassessed it. And I said, you know, there's something missing here uh, for me. In my ability to get my message out, I wrote a good book. I think it's nice. I think I'm helping my clients, but what am I missing? And then I went back and I analyzed all the clients I talked about, and I found out what I was missing, uh, Kerry and, and Paul. I was missing teammates. I was trying to do it myself. And I think of all the things we try to do in our life, and, you know, both you and Paul are, are very accomplished in your own fields as well, the missing ingredient for all of us is, is help. None of us has ever done anything by themselves. Kerry, you had a long, distinguished hockey career in Europe, but you had teammates. Paul, you were on Team Canada, and you had great success in the Paralympics, but you had teammates. So I needed teammates. And I got together with, and again, you take it for what it's worth, uh, my personal philosophy of living is that, you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. So I was in the wrong room a lot. And I don't mean that to say, oh, so you think you're smart. It's like, no, it's, it's actually the opposite. I don't think I'm smart enough. And the only way to get smart is be in the same room with people who are smarter than you are. So the two gentlemen who wrote this book with me, Jim Rooney was the owner of the Guelph Storm of the Ontario Hockey League for 15 years. He was on the board of directors of the OHL uh, for about as long was a high school teacher and then a high school principal, is in the Guelph Sports Hall of Fame, was a commissioner of the Intercounty Baseball League, and I can go on, but I'll leave it at that. Chris DePiro, coach general manager of the Oshawa Generals for seven years, including the years John Tavares uh, was with the team, scout for the Pittsburgh Penguins, athletic director at St. Michael's uh, College High School, uh, teacher at St. Mike's High School, now in administration there, I became the third smartest person in the room. So I took what I learned from 2013 to 19, brought it together with those two, and what we've created is a book that you've already shown that we believe yeah. it's kind of like a little bit of a hokey title. It's like, well, 
how to live better and get what you want faster. And we kind of chuckle about it. But we're pretty confident we can help people do that. We are. We have a personal development coaching program. And we're selling the book. We're flogging the book. We're doing our stuff. But what we really want people to do is, all right, maybe pick it up and read it. But contact us and find out if you think you need teammates in the same way I discovered I needed teammates. I thought yeah. I did a real good job personal development coaching for 2013 to 19 until I met those two guys and realized now I've gone to another level. So the book is about dealing with life, working through exercises. It's a structured program. It's not just a self-help feel good. Hey, everything's great. It's a case. No, everything may not be great, but there's great in everything. So along with Jim and Chris, we put it together and Henderson was a, the book was a thrill of a lifetime. I got Paul Henderson, yeah. are you kidding me? And it was a Globe and Mail bestseller. Jimmy Devolano's book was terrific. Greatest day ever did very well. I've never written anything more important in my life than this latest book. So we're yeah. hoping it goes well, but we're more hoping that people realize that you don't achieve anything great in life by yourself. Find a teammate. And that's why it's called the power of teammates. Well, Roger, uh, you know, every time I get a chance to talk to you on the phone, you're always so open. You give incredible advice that allows you to kind of walk away from the phone saying, all right, I love it. And when you talked about this book and now you've kind of given me the premise, I'm like Larry King. I, I listened to him do his interviews and he said, I shouldn't like put myself in his level, but he did say, don't read somebody's book before you interview them. So I say that because I don't read a lot. So I'm gonna make a, a an honest a statement here. I'm gonna read this book because one of the things that I learned on my journey is exactly what you said, how important teammates were. And I'll just make one reference to that. I was, you know, I never made it to the NHL and I got to play at a high level in Germany and I was a player coach and I was struggling. I My captain, I was a captain and player and coach of the team and it was just not going right. And the first year was, really tough and I almost lost my job. And then I realized, you know what, I've got to lead these guys as, as a coach. I need somebody who can do that for me. And I got a kid named Mark McKay. Uh, he became my captain. And that's when I learned how valuable teammates were. Not that I didn't know that prior to, because playing on sports teams, Roger, you know, you don't win unless you have great teammates. And so well, I'm really looking forward to, to, sorry, I'm really looking forward to listening to your perspective. Even at 61, I want to learn how to become a better teammate. Well, Kerry, thank you for that. And you know, it's a great story and you're right. We all have examples of it in our life. And, and here's one of the things I discovered during the personal development coaching and all the time involved in the writing of this book and the preparing of the book is that there isn't anything in this book or in anything else that we don't already know. And my partner, Chris DePiro has put it very well. He said, one of the things we have to do in life is close the gap between what we know and what we do. And that's where teammates and coaches helping you do that. Everybody says, come on, oh, you got to work hard and you got to exercise right and pay off your credit cards every month. Don't carry a balance and look after your money. And uh, you, well, we don't know this. The people in the plan, every, every single person in the world knows yeah. what they have to do to be successful then why don't they do it? And one of the big reasons is they're not held accountable. They don't have teammates. Up. They're trying to do it by themselves. And as far as Larry King goes, he also, our, our book is filled with motivational quotes, motivational tweets. We have a Twitter account that puts one out every day. We collected the first year in the book. We're going to do that in future books and all of that. Oh, uh, there's all kinds of stuff like that. But Larry King had one of the quotes. It's not in this book, I believe. I think it's in a future edi edition further down the road. And he said, and this is a great interview talking, you don't learn anything by talking. You just repeat what you already know. And I would also add to that, you also repeat what you think you know and maybe what you don't know and maybe what isn't true. And that's where getting people to work with you and talk. And Carrie, we're all, we all have the same thing in common. We're all so much better with everybody else's problems than our own, aren't we? Uh, oh, yes, we are. Isn't that the truth, man? That's gospel. I'm going to take that advice, pay off my credit card, but it's a little higher than I thought. So it's going to be a little bit For tough. Everybody. <laughs> I wanted to, the right-hand side, there's some, just before we bring Paul up and, and talk about, obviously, a great project and and what you've done for Paul is just absolutely amazing. Um, Mark Lee, 
was a little sick. Glad to watch, especially with one of the guy, good guys on air besides you two. Thanks. Roger is a class act, no question. Uh, Robert Wine, I agree with Roger. If you're the smartest, fastest, best, whatever, then the only way is down. Not being, it means that you can improve and go up. And, and as this pandemic has hit, uh, all of us, we've had to take inventory. And that's what happened to me because I was one of those guys that just go, 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 never took time out. Uh, and I actually found out that I own nine screw guns. Who needs nine screw guns? So I had a chance to stop and take inventory of my life, not only the physical, but the mental. And I think what, what uh, your new book is, I want to read it because I do want to learn because when we come out of this, we're going to be, we're going to need more teammates to make this world run better and certainly for ourselves. And uh, that's almost being selfish because I do want to learn and get better. So thank you for writing this book. And I'm sure it's going to be as well uh, a big seller. Now I'd like to go into Paul Rosen. Uh, Paul, a uh, very good friend of mine. We started out with Gooch and, uh, you know, Gooch with Paul Rose, featuring Paul Rosen. Uh, and then Paul just became too big for me. And he had to do his own show called The Rosen Report, which I think is absolutely fantastic on, on giving a voice to people that sometimes don't get, get that voice. And, you know, here we are sitting with one of the icons or legends of broadcasting and, and journalism, Roger Lejoie. And I consider myself just a uh, an amateur at this because I'm learning how to do it. And, it, you know, it's as you said, everybody can stand in front of a mic or get in front of a camera. But it does take a little bit of uh, training and understanding. And Paul and I have done this for years, trying to learn how to do it properly. And I just find it very interesting when you have somebody like yourself, Roger, to take on a project of telling uh, people about Paul Rosen. I know it's a manuscript, and, or sorry, it's kind of a, a story told by Paul and you being able to put it together. I wanted to ask you while Paul was here, how difficult is that to listen to somebody's story and then put those words to paper, or sorry, yeah, to paper, and then obviously publish it in a book. I really want to understand that because when I when I did my book with Keith Primo, it was more about concussions and knowledgeable and trying to get other people's involvement. But you're just one on one with with a guy and him telling his story. Well, f first of all, you know, Carrie, and thank you for that again. Um, listen, everything. Uh, I think it was. Uh, uh, I forget which philosopher, it's one of our teammates quote that's in the book, everything is difficult before it becomes easy. So when I first did the Henderson book in 2008 and was the first one I had done in a similar vein that I'm working on the book with Rosie, uh, that one was more difficult then, although it became much easier as we went through the process. So again, um, I, I've got 41 years experience in, in sports media. I, is doing a radio show, a sports talk radio show, uh, how difficult is it? Well, it's it's not difficult for me anymore because I've got all this experience. I found the same thing with the books and, and with Paul's story. One of the things I mentioned, I have the four published books on Amazon. I have done similar books like this with other people who are not as high profile as Rosie. They're, they're, they're you know, just, I don't want to say regular people. We all got a story to tell. Everybody's story, life story is worth telling. But people want it done for their family, something like that. So I have a lot of experience uh, going through the process with people. I found Paul very easy, quite frankly, not just because I have more experience in those, but Rosie was incredibly candid. He understood what he wanted to have said. He was organized. We could do it chronologically. And Paul will back me up. Sometimes you got to go back and say, oh, I got to conclude this story or let's take that up. That's just part and parcel of, of how it goes. I think the degree of difficulty of a project is, is the degree of passion and interest the person has in making sure you get their story right. So this one was real easy, uh, to be honest with you, although it's time consuming, it's work, don't get me wrong, but the process really involves somebody deciding, you know, I think it's important I get my words out and I do it and you take the time to do it properly. So Paul has made this as easy as possible. And yeah, listen, I'm not going to lie. It's, it's 50,000 plus word books or not quote unquote, easy uh, to write. But it's been a very engaging, enlightening and uh, fun project. And when it's that, then the work takes care of itself. We're all we're in basically the stretch run of it now. And I've enjoyed it extremely much. And uh, yes, uh, when the book is published, and it'll be sometime in this calendar year, uh, we'll be back on to talk about it. And Carrie, you talk about re books you should read. 
this is one I think everybody should read. I appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, Kerry's, uh, Kerry's in it. There's a piece on it. The one thing that, that I want uh, people to understand is people have asked me for years, for probably the last 15 years, why haven't you written a book? Why? And, and I've thought about it, and we talked about this. I, I just didn't find the right fit until we talked that first time. And we went back and forth a few times until you were comfortable. And, and I knew right away that it was going to be a, a good match because I respected you. And I, I don't think I could have somebody get into my personal story that I didn't respect. Because at the very beginning, when we were talking, like I was telling you some pretty deep personal things that I wasn't sure whether I wanted in. And, you know, there were some times when I got fairly emotional. Um, so it was a tough process at the beginning. And we had to take a break, uh, about three-week, four-week break, uh, because it was so difficult on me and then other things happening in my life that I had to back away for a little bit uh, until we got back at it. Um, so it's definitely not an easy process. But reading the, uh, the final... Uh, manuscript that you gave me to look at um, going through it again it brought me to tears many times because there were stories that I totally forgot about and as we start talking and you say okay talk to me about this and tell me about this stretch and and my mind's going and uh, it's uh, it, it's definitely a um, it's definitely a process that, that helped me heal a lot. And, you know, I'm only yesterday was 26 months clean and sober. Uh, the 30th of, uh, of January, 2019 was that, you know, almost fatal day. And, and the way you start, I'm not going to give anything away because, but the way you started the book and the way you came to me with the start of the book, that's what sold me immediately. Here's, here's a, here's a spoiler alert for everybody. Everything turns out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, he's right here. Uh, okay. Listen, I was there on I, Roger. I was there on that fateful day, flying in from uh, I think it was flying in from London, England. When I got the call from, uh, I was actually on the plane when the when the call came, and you know, I, I picked I picked it up, and I know you're not supposed to, and it was uh, Rosie's daughter. Uh, listen, one of the things that we're forgetting to say, I don't think we've heard it. What's the name of the book? Paul, well, give him the title. Uh, it is the meaning of life, the Paul Rosen story. Amazing. So, uh, Roger, if you don't mind me asking, how do you come up with a title? Is it is it Paul's responsibility, or as a as a as an author, do you say you take it all in? Because that's one thing. Ours was called concussed. Pretty pretty easy to figure that one out. But for you, you've got to. Uh, do you read the story? Do you get the manuscript? Do you go through all the feelings and then do the title of the book? Or as an author, do you, because uh, I don't consider myself an author, uh, because I think it's really important to understand the profession. There's got to be an art to it. And everybody's got a different uh, way to paint the picture, I'm sure. But for you, did you did you have to listen to Paul and then pick a title? Or did he come up with it? Or do you say, hang on a sec here, I've already got it in my mind? Well, end of the day, uh, when it comes down to, and listen, you know, Paul mentions uh, the meaning of my life, which is really a gist of it. Um, um, and, and Paul has said, and actually, you know, when the book comes out and on the front cover of the book, it isn't necessarily the meaning of my life. That's kind of a subtitle. Rosie's mantra was never give up. And he signs, as you guys know, and Paul's talking many times, he signs his, you know, all his autographs with with never give up. So I'm into the story. I'm listening. I'm watching. And by the way, as far as titles go, titles are the last thing that, that come across. Uh, the goal right. of my life with Paul Henderson is kind of a double entendre. The goal of his life was 72 Canada, but the goal of Paul Henderson's life is to spread the meaning of Christ. It's, it's, right. a, it's a double, uh, the road to hockey town for Jimmy Devilano. Well, it didn't take a genius to come up with that one. I mean, he's like, it's, it's, it's road to hockey town. But Paul says, never give up. Never give up. So we're going through it. We're going through. We're going through, and, and never give up. And beginning of the, and then so as I got near the end of the book, and we're putting it together, I said, okay, so what is the meaning of this? And I think at the end, and Victor Frankel is one of the uh, psychologists that we use in the book, and Paul's read it, so he knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. But but he came up and and he was challenged with a lot of people throughout, and he wrote a book. 
uh, the meaning meaning of life. It's it's a world well known book, and of course Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor, and his challenge was like to find the meaning of all this. So Paulus had challenges, and he had you know, tough stories and uh, you know upbringing and everything else. But at the end of the day, you want the leader to close the book. Well, what was the point of it? What's the meaning of this? And I think we have successfully done that. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Once you read the book, you will really, the last thing you will think is, so that's why it happened. And I'll give you the teaser. And Paul is share, he, he understands it, is like, so, you know, you mentioned horrible day 26 months ago and everything else. What was the meaning of it? Well, that's the goal of the book. I hope, I don't hope, I know we're going to do it. It's almost finished. You'll read the book and you will understand what the meaning of that day was. And that, so, yeah. I'm not getting into details about, but that. Yeah, no, no, we got to sell the book. Don't be silly. Right. right. Listen, so, Robert, never, why... ne never give up the meaning of my life. The Paul Rosen story uh, will all be incorporated one way or another on it. And, but yes, you will know the meaning of, of uh, Paul, what happened to Paul and why um, why it happened and why it will benefit a lot of people. And in a lot of ways, uh, The Power of Teammates is all about self-improvement. I think Paul Rosen's book is going to be too. So uh, never give up. So Robert, uh, Robert Wine, who's a big listener of ours, I, I never thought of it, how the title is found, but Kerry thanks. It's an awesome question because I'd love to hear it. Well, you've heard it. And Robert can't read physical books. So is it on Kobo? Or are you able to buy it any other way than just, just a, a physical copy? Once the book is uh, prepared and ready to go, it'll be available in just about every format you can do. Okay, and great. if you and we, we do have services that can be involved. So if that listener is, is interested in that, Kerry, you can send me his information and I'll be very happy to uh, uh, do that uh, for him and make sure he gets that when it's done. We're yeah, still like the, the book is almost written, but it's, it's several months down the road before it gets yeah, done. But believe me, yeah. you will be hearing from Paul and I an awful lot about where and how to get the book. Don't worry one iota about that. <laughs> and you know I'll be a big trumpet for it because I love both of you. Hey, listen, I wanted to ask you that now because uh, it would be an interesting for like Robert. He always wants to know if it's on Kobo. Is it on Kobo? Because that's the only way he can read books. So I wanted to ask you, uh, Roger, because obviously the Paul Rosen story, it's a personal book and, and you had an opportunity to talk directly with him. Talk to me about how the process works. Like, obviously, let's say it's not Paul, it's just somebody, hey, I'd like you to write me a book. How, what's the process? Like, how do you, how do you determine, how did you say, okay, Paul, I'll do it. I know you guys knew each other before, but what's the process of you start it, you do a, you write it, you start taking notes. You obviously sit on a telephone here. I'm sure it was more challenging because you couldn't come together. So either virtual calls, or telephone calls. And then of course you then sit there and start putting these notes together and then you say, okay, now I got to build a manuscript. You build a manuscript, you get sign off. Then you got to go and get a publisher and do all that sort of stuff. Walk us through that process, if you don't mind, Roger. Well, you you pretty much answered your own question. Like that's, <laughs> that's like exactly what we did. It's like, yeah, okay, let's do it. I call them up. I do the right, interview. Sorry about that. <laughs> now, the publisher part is different, though, because, uh, Carrie, one of the things, and um, – I should give full credit here. McClellan Stewart was the publisher of The Goal of My Life, which was a, a Globe and Mail a bestseller. Wiley Publishing was the publisher of um, uh, The Road to Hockey Town with Jimmy Devolano. But it is the same kind of thing we're seeing in the publishing business we're seeing in the media business. So where are people listening to this now show right now? You're not on television. You're not on radio. You are doing it yourself. You're putting a podcast out there. You're putting it out. The book publishing industry is undergoing the same kind of situation. And I made a conscious decision with Paul from the start that we were going to do it. You, you could call it self-publishing because it really isn't. Uh, Friesen Press is an outstanding Canadian publisher based in BC that has done thousands of these kind of books, including The Power of Teammates, which is, and I know it doesn't do justice here, but it is a beautifully, beautifully put together That's book. Good, yeah. <laughs> Could be in any bookstore bookshelf. You'll be very proud of it. And then it's incumbent on the author in the same way it is with anyone who's doing their own thing to work with someone. So they're my teammates for this. Friesen Press was, were our publishing teammates for the power of teammates. And they will be the uh, 
publishing partner of my book with Paul, uh, Never Give Up, um, when it does come out. That process has changed. I know that people are different. I know you've had several authors that have been on uh, who are continuing to work with traditional publishing, but I'll give you full disclosure. In my humble opinion, um, the author in traditional publishing is not making enough money. That's my opinion. Uh, I, 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 I just, I, I think in, in the same way where traditional newspapers and traditional media are bogged down by extra cost and studios, and it's, it's just not feasible. So to give us the best opportunity for us, Paul and I, to make money off this book, and by the way, I have no hesitations in saying that, um, and making, and by the way, any, I tell my students this all the time, uh, it's a case of if you can't find a way to monotonize your business, then you don't you're no, you don't have a business. You have a hobby. You yeah. don't have a career. You have a hobby. So I have a career. I have worked in traditional media. I have worked with traditional publishing. I'm an old school guy, but I also know this is the preferred way to publish books in 2021. And I'm very confident it will be a great success for us under those terms. So to the last part of the question. I had to go find the, the good publisher. I didn't have to look far. Freezing Press is terrific. I love them. Uh, they're absolutely delighted. So, uh, and, and if people want to know, yes, Paul and I take on some financial responsibility at the start of this. There isn't an advance like there is in traditional publishing. But once the book is out and circulating, the profits are all returned to the author. Right. And I like so that I map a little bit better than getting, you know, pennies. And frankly, sometimes after years, honestly, it's pennies per book. And I know that other people want to do, and maybe other authors, I don't know, they got better agents, so they cut better deals than I did. But uh, I, that's a lot of work for not much. So that's how we went about that. And yes, uh, I don't know, Rosie, maybe 75, 80 phone calls and uh, follow-ups and meetings to change the, the so, Carrie, you, like I said, I, I can't answer the question any better than you did. The first part of it is exactly right. Paul, you want to do it? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> Interview, ask questions, write. You like it? Yeah, change. And there you go. So I could be a publisher now that I did that. Yeah, absolutely. The only reason I asked that question, because I went through it. I got a call from somebody in Edmonton saying, hey, we, I find a book on concussions other than a medical book. Would you write it? And I said, okay, Keith and I, and you know all that sort of stuff. I won't bore you with all the details. And they actually said, we'll give you upfront money. And it wasn't very much. So, of course, I took it. And at the end, we sold almost 4,000 books. I still owe them money. So you're right. I think you got to watch because I did give away a couple books. So, for, you know. Don't well, that, give away books. That is Sell the one books. thing Roger said to me at the very beginning. I can autograph all the books that people want to autograph, but I ain't giving away a book. He's in charge of all that. No free well, books. I, I, I will also tell you, too, as far as the business goes, and again, in all, all kidding aside, it's a case of one of the difficulties that people in sports media, authors, broadcasters do, is our content is so much fun. We're, we're, we're all doing it for nothing or would do it for nothing. Just because we would do it for nothing doesn't mean we should do it for nothing. There Absolutely. is value to this kind of thing. And, you know, I get all the time. I even got it with the power of teammates. You know, hey, Raj, I heard you got another book coming out. Man, don't forget about your friends when the book comes out. And I said, don't you worry. You're going to get an invitation to buy. First thing. First thing I'm going to send you. You'll be the, you're my friend. You're the, you're the first one. Yes. So and it's a matter of like, and listen, guys, ultimately we have to have enough faith and belief in ourselves that the content we're producing is worthy of money. And if it's I'm not, sure. that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. But I'm going to go back to what I said a few minutes ago. It's a hobby then. It's not a career. It's not a business. I'm, I'm a broadcast teacher. I, I was at college sports media, Ryerson University. And we're teaching people to get into the sports media career. I'm not teaching people to get into the sports media hobby. If you just want a hobby, go do it. The easiest thing in the world now, with all due respect really? to everybody, is to do a podcast, is to do a have a website. Is anybody can do that. You can start tonight. Go on GoDaddy for 15 bucks a year. You're all set. That's great. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's a hobby. That's not a business. That's not a career. I have a career. And when yeah. I'm producing these things, I am making money. And if you don't want them, that's fine. I, listen, 
Nobody's forcing you to buy anything. So you have to be. And that's where I think the gap, guys, between traditional media, it's easy. You, you do shows. Uh, you broadcast. You do shows on Sportsnet, the fan. They pay you. Easy. Yeah. All done. You, you go out and do your own thing. Then you, it's incumbent on you to get your own sponsors or subscription 100%. or Patreon or whatever it, it takes. But if you don't take that second step, you don't have a career. You have a hobby. Now, this is not a hobby for me. This is a career. My livelihood is this. And anybody who wants a free book, I'll say to them, what do you do for a living? I'm a carpenter. Okay, come to my house and fix my cabinets for nothing. Then. And I'll give you a book. Yeah, well, then Contra, that's different, right? Then that's different. But I, my yeah. point is, would you, yeah, I know. Do you, I got it. Are they expected to do it for nothing? Yeah. Does your dentist say, oh, listen, uh, don't charge me today, no problem? Like, come on, this is what we do. Yeah. If this is what you do and it's your career, you got to ask somebody for money. If not, yeah. you got a hobby. And if you got a hobby, that's fine. You know what? Have a hobby. Um, yeah. I prefer. I, I'm glad my dentist is, is in a hobby. He has a career. I'm glad he charges me. I don't want anybody. Uh, doing stuff like doctor and uh, and for that matter, a carpenter or electrician. Yeah. I don't expect them to work for nothing. I'm not working for nothing either. They're end of rent. Well, you mentioned dentist. I got to go there tomorrow morning. So I hope he doesn't. I'll try and give him a book for my tooth. Hey, listen, Kevin Hewn, great comment too. It's no different than any business selling a product. If the company goes it all the way, there's no income or revenue. No question there. And in closing, I'm told it is going to be a must read. So looking forward to the release. Roger is great. Listen, I'm going to give you both that, that an opportunity. Brother. Yeah. I know. We love it. I, I didn't want to do this. Well, this one's Excuse already me. out on Amazon.ca. So I want to get that plug in before we go. And I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Amazon. Our teammates. I have, an yeah. I have an author page there. Uh, all four books are listed there. Paul's will be listed there when it's out. So believe me, we will let you know. Uh, it's available at Amazon.ca, BarnesandNoble.com. Um, we we actually have a, a email address, teammates at Rogers.com. If people are interested in the coaching, they can reach out. And if they want to buy the book, independently from us, we can take the orders as well. We accept PayPal. We do uh, things like that. They can order directly from us. And again, I cannot thank my partners enough. This is not me. The difference in this one for me is my teammates, Jim Rooney, Chris DePiro. When the three of us are in the room, I became the third smartest person in the room. And as a result, I'm now smarter. The only way to get smart is not be the smartest person in the room too often. Great, and I'm great grateful advice. for them so much. So much. Great advice. Paul, final yeah, you, point. Yeah, my final thought will be if you're out there and you want your uh, life story to be told, I think the the most important thing in this journey for me uh, was find somebody that you trust and respect. Every process, every part of this journey over the last five, six months has been uh, the fact that Roger tells me what he thinks, and because I trust him and I respect him, it is so much easier for me when we talked about publishing. I know nothing about it, but I respect him, and I trust him, and I've seen everything he's put out and followed him for years. For right then, I felt so comfortable with saying so many times, Raj, I trust you. Um, I think that's critical to being on the part of letting somebody be a part of writing this for you, uh, that trust factor. Yeah, well. Well, I appreciate I did, that, Rosie, uh, so much. And Kerry, just very, really quickly, yeah, I just want to yeah, add that yeah. I don't mean this as a um, as, as condemning the traditional publishing industry. Listen, I had no, two no, great partners that. and two great books. Yeah. And, and, but, uh, you know, the, the important thing, again, when, when Paul talks about it is like, there's only a certain percentage of, of people, if Wayne Gretzky wants to write another book, if, if Michael Jordan wants to write, if LeBron James wants to write a book, of course they're going to get gazillions of dollars in an advance. Of big, but that's a very, very small portion. But what about people who have had great, intriguing, and important lives like Paul? And 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 any, pick, pick your other, like, you, you look at all the sports books that are out there. How many people, even listening to this, haven't written their book? Because a publisher isn't going to give you a big advance because you're not big enough but your yeah. life is still important your your oh, life absolutely. is still worth sharing with somebody so you yeah. find another way to do it and it's the same thing with broadcasting if you're if you can't get hired by sportsnet or tsn go do your own thing it's no different 
in, in, in the publishing business. And I can't really stress that enough for people who are starting in the business is you find, find your own. There's more than one way to bring a project home uh, to its completion. And I very much appreciate that, Paul, and the trust and, uh, and friendship goes likewise, my friend. Well, guys, I'm really excited about being a part of it. I'm glad, I, I'm honored that I'm going to be in in the book. I, I played a small role in, in Rosie's life, but to be a part of it is truly a blessing. And and I want to say to you, Roger, even uh, we were in the green room talking, you know, your offer to, to get Jordan to help. He's in this field. You're such an accommodating man. I can't thank you enough for the advice you've given me and so many along the way. Thank you for being a part of our day today. It's been amazing to sit down with Roger LeJoie and talk about his new book, of course, but as important, the one that's coming out with Rosie. Uh, we will be purchasing a couple of books for sure, and I know that uh, our listeners will also be doing that. So, Roger, thank you. All the things that you do for sport, it's amazing. Well, Kerry and Paul, thank you very much. And I, I guess a final word for anybody who's listening is that uh, forget about projects and books and selling and everything else. I just suggest to everybody, especially in this day and time and these challenging times we're in, be an encourager, not a discourager. Uplift people. Don't degrade them. If, if b Before you post, before you put a comment, before you say anything, ask yourself, yeah. is this contributing to the conversation? Is this adding to anybody's life? It is easy to blame. It's easy to be a critic. It's easy. And by the way, even when you're trying to be sarcastic, sarcasm doesn't work on social media, especially no, when you're typing it. It just doesn't come across. If it doesn't add to the conversation and make people feel better, how about you keep it? Because what you give out is coming right back at you. And that's 100%. not pop psychology. That's physics. Yeah. That's physics. That's not pop psychology. Oh, yeah. Well, you get back what you give. That's physics, and I believe that very much. And I look forward to Paul's book being out. You guys are doing a terrific job on your show. It's always kind of nice to come and, and chat with you. And, yes, if people would be kind enough to buy my book, great. But I tell you what, even if you don't, find some teammates and spend some time working on your life issues, okay? You don't have to give me a dime. Go to friends, mentors, coaches. Get some help. You can't do it by yourself. Nobody accomplishes anything great alone. And even I, after all these years, had to learn that. And I had to find some teammates. If I can admit that at age 63, I think you can too. My blessings to you both and to all your audience. All the best to you. You're beautiful. Thanks. Roger LeJoie. Thank you, boys. Bye. How great was that? I love listening to him talk. And a lot of the guys that are on here, I look forward to, you know, Sam Trapolino. There's a bunch of guys from Australia that weren't on the show today. I know they'll be watching this. Uh, they love Roger. I, I think we'll get a fan club over in Australia. Hey, Paul, can't thank you enough for opening up and being honest with us. Uh, I know that the book is going to be amazing. Uh, if you just want to tell us, um, what, what, do you, what do you expect? Like over the next couple of months as it comes out, uh, I know I was excited. It wasn't a book about me. It was just a book about concussions. But, man, I was so excited about when I had that copy in my hand. What are you looking for? Um, I'm looking forward to getting my story out, to getting people to see I was really uh, vulnerable. I, I told some stories that that very few people know Um some stories that maybe only God and my girlfriend know, uh, but everybody will know. Uh, chapter 32, I think, is uh, called Gooch Live. Um, so there's uh, there's a little bit about us and, and our oh, journey yeah. together. Um, I'm just, I'm really looking forward to people seeing it and going, oh my God, I had no clue. I, I thought Rosie was the goalie, the great Rosie goalie, who was always so bubbly and talking to people. I had no clue that he went through this, this, and this. And, and I was open, man. I told some, I told some stories and I, and I made sure that I, I hurt nobody. Um, no, nobody will read this and, and think I threw them under the bus. All right, Rosie, thank you, bud. Look forward to Rosen report tomorrow. Who do we got on? Oh, my God. Mark DeMontis, uh, what an unbelievable story. Uh, went blind at 17, visually impaired, uh, started Courage Canada, started the Canadian blind hockey team, is going to be this September rollerblading from Windsor to Ottawa, 1,000 kilometers to raise $100,000. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Okay, Paul, listen, we'll be talking tomorrow anyways. Uh, obviously, we're going to watch the Leafs. 
against the Jets tonight. We'll see what goes on there. Uh, it is expected Campbell will uh, be in net. Uh, breaking news just now. The Canucks have signed uh, Thatcher Demko to a five-year, $25 million contract, so they believe he's the future. What does that mean for Holtby? Uh, we'll talk about that this weekend. Paul, thanks. Thanks for joining us, bud. Take care. Thank you, Gooch. Bye. Wow, too great. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm actually in a book. You know, I was in another book. It was just a small little paragraph, but Johnny Scott – uh, when I took him to Australia. And it's kind of neat to open up a book and read your name. You know, you feel honored. I can't wait to find out from Paul who's going to play me in the movie. I'm thinking Brad Pitt. You know, well, I got to get a better suit, I think, you know. Um, or as a lot of people with my life, if not the looks. Uh, let me, hmm. I'll think about that. I'll think about who would play me in the movie. Hey, buddy. Jordan, thanks okay. for being with us. Thanks for being the producer today. I know we got to do hump day. Our buddy, uh, he always has a tough time with that hump day performers. So you and I'll do it really quickly. Thank you for producing the show. It was fantastic. Wow. Roger, smart dude. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, it's, it's a pretty easy task. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, let's go through it really quickly before we get into it. Connor McDavid shows a little bit of grit, uh, gets fined 5000 It was two a two-minute penalty. People were on the internet. He should be suspended and thrown out of the game, all that sort of stuff. Did you like it? Like, I actually looked at it because I was never a tough dude. He's never gone – he's never crossed the line. I don't even think last night was crossing the line. Crosby, Ovechkin, Ovechkin – doles out a lot of punishment to a lot of guys. You know, Crosby took it for years. Gretzky took it. Lemieux. And I just think it was enough. And and he just, he came to a boiling point and showed that he's not going to be a pushover and that he's going to defend himself. Uh, your thoughts on that? I, you, you love to see it. Like, whenever a star player like, like that gets a little chippy, it, it makes the game a little more interesting to watch. I mean, he also did this, his draft here uh, out in Erie. Um, a couple, of, couple of months before the draft, he got a big fight in the corner. Uh, he ended up breaking his hand by when he punched the glass. But, I mean, this isn't the first time we've seen it. And I'm not sure. I'm it's definitely not going to be the last. I'm just excited. Let's see what uh, else he does. Well, somebody says, uh, uh, well, thank you about that, Kevin. You're amazing, too. And Donna McCarthy, Alec Baldwin, uh, the good one or the bad one? <laughs> Whatever personality comes out. Danny DeVito, that's who I'm thinking should play me in my life story because Throw Mom Up from the Train was the absolute greatest movie of all time. And that was that's that was my life until, unfortunately, I lost my beautiful mother. Uh, listen, let's get right into it. we got to get quickly here into the Hump Day performers. I'm going to give you – who's your number three? My number three is uh, – it's going to be Mitch Marner. Uh, you only have five points in five games, but I think uh, moving forward uh, for the least, he's going to be a critical player for them. Uh, you know, get some secondary scoring, set, setting people up. But, you know, maybe the five points doesn't isn't that great, uh, attractive, but, you know, it's, it's still a vital role to play in that cog. Well, you know, uh, obviously we love trying to challenge each other. You helped me out a little bit getting my guys together. Uh, I was I was really thinking about a Winnipeg Jets uh, who's, who has been incredible over the last couple of games. Uh, he was struggling a little bit, even though he's got good points. I'll give you – I think he's my first star this this week because of what he's done for me and making my Jets. But I want to go to another gritty player this week, yeah. Sidney Crosby. Three goals, five assists. Uh, the reason why I pick him on the third spot is that without Malkin, the Pittsburgh Penguins seem to be destined to make sure they make the playoffs. It could go south anytime you lose a player of Malkin's quality. We don't know how long he's going to be out. So I'm going to go with Sidney Crosby uh, because it, it seems like they haven't missed a beat. Uh, it hasn't been his best year yet, but he has been there to lead the guys when they need it. And I like his grit too. I love, you know, when, and there's some people call him a whiner. And even now I'm going to guarantee if people are going to, you know, look at my, uh, Connor McDavid, a little bit of a sissy and all that sort of stuff. Didn't go his way, so he's got to throw an elbow. No, he's just saying, listen, guys, I'm here to play. Yeah, I'll score a lot of goals. Yes, I'll put, uh, uh, you know, uh, add a bunch of assists for a lot of points, but I'm here to play. You're going to try and take liberties of me? Stay awake because I'm here to play for keeps. Yeah, he, he can just turn it on whenever he wants to. That's the thing with him. Don't get him. Don't wake the lion. Exactly. Right, who's your number two? My number two is Nathan McKinnon. Uh, you know, it's seven points in his last five games. 
with the exception of one game against Vegas, he had a point in, in all in all of his last five games. Um, you know, and and, yeah, and he leads that team, and they're poised to do big things in the playoffs this year. So, uh, it, they're they're an exciting team to watch. They're a fun team to watch. Uh, I'm hoping that they could finally do something big uh, in the in the uh, postseason. Okay, so my number two is Alexander Barkov. Uh, the reason is the Florida Panthers look uh, solid. You, you know, I love Chris Streeter, of course, uh, not only in Winnipeg, but if he came over to uh, Ice Hockey Classic. But the Florida Panthers, for me, are a little bit – Joe Quinball has been doing an incredible job with that team. But I, I just – I don't know. This kid Barkov has all the talents to be a superstar. We don't hear a lot about him. Obviously, playing in Florida, up here, we don't we don't hear too much about him. But I'll tell you what: what he can do with a puck, he's a magic man, and he's yeah. leading that team. And I think I think they're going to go long in the playoffs. And if he continues up the play that he's got, they're going long. And uh, with my final pick, I'm going with the Rangers player, uh, Adam Fox. Uh, he's a defenseman, but he has 12 points in his last five games, including a five assist night against the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, I mean, when you watch this kid play, it's it, it's it's I, I haven't seen many players that do what he does. He looks so calm when he has the puck in his own end. He he can skate it out. He can move it out. He does everything that I think he's being a Norris Trophy candidate this year. Uh, he won't win it. I think it's headman's to lose, but uh, in the fo- in the future, he will be a Norris candidate or a winner. And Kevin Hune saying Barkov is underrated, and I'm going to go with you on the Fox story. I heard a story about him last night after his game. I didn't even know who he was, uh, but you know, do you know his story? Because it was a great, yeah. great yeah. story. Can you tell he, us, tell he, us uh, a little he, bit about because he, he, he played at Harvard. Uh, is where he played in university. He was drafted by the Flames in the fifth round, uh, 166th overall, um, and then um, he got traded. He was part of the Dougie Hamilton trade to Carolina. Um, I can't remember what what else was in there, but uh, and then the Rangers made a, made a play for him when we gave him Brady Shea, uh, who was a, a top four defenseman for us. N- nothing uh, nothing spectacular, but Adam Fox has just been everything that you could hope for and and more. Yeah, and they said that last night on the uh, watching the game. Hey, listen, this is really cool. You're the, a New York Ranger fan. Your number one player is a Ranger. Is exactly. this is there a theme here? Yes, there is because I'm going to pick. A Winnipeg Jets, and the reason is, is not only it's him. I think there's there's a message here in the madness. My player this this for this week is Shifley. He has had a great career so far. He's been the leader in the Winnipeg Jets. Struggling a little bit, not not a hundred. You know, they've been changing line mates, and I got to do a shout out to Paul Maurice. He made a shift with Ehlers and 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 um, uh, Connors. Uh, what a great move. Uh, I, I don't know. It just gave him youthfulness. He just jumped on that loose puck. He took the shot from, I think it was Ehlers, if I'm not mistaken, that great move that Ehlers put on the defenseman, dropped it to his skate, kicked it, went around him, put it out front. Shifley took the first shot and didn't quit on it. Big save, got back on his stick. Boom, he put it into the empty net. I like what Shifley's doing. I like his leadership. I think it, he was revised a little bit uh, or really re- I would say more reborn when he went with those two young guys. And what they're doing right now is incredible. And tonight we're going to see it again. I'm hoping that Shifley uh, and that line outplays, of course, Matthews and Marner, who's also you picked the third star. I really like his game right now. I think he has taken over top of of Matthews right at this moment as a team leader as far as I'm concerned. He's gritty. He's great. And that's taking nothing away from Matthews. Okay, he's playing with an injury, and he's showing us a lot of a lot of kunas, kunas. But I'm going to go with Shifley only for the simple fact that yes, I am a Winnipeg Jet fan, but also it's always tough to be at the top. You got to stay at the top, and he's now showing us he wants to be the guy that carries the Winnipeg Jets into first spot in the in the North Division and up against the Toronto Maple Leafs tonight. As we close off, great point by uh, Val Silva, our executive producer. If DeVito is playing you, does that mean he's Billy Crystal? Absolutely, no question. Uh, I want you to do a quick prediction. Jets, Leafs? I'm going 3-1 Jets. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I'm going going 4-2. 4-2 
for two Jets. Just I, I still will talk about it again. The goaltending. I talk with uh, Wayne Cowley tomorrow. Joins me for lunch uh, with Gooch and friends. We're going to be talking solely about goaltenders, and we're going to talk about the situation in Toronto. I am not a. I, I am not a Leafs hater. People have already come out and said I'm not. I love the Leafs. I love the two jerseys behind you. I hope the Leafs do very well. It's great for hockey. But we have to also look at it realistically. There is a goaltender issue. They've got to deal with it. Is Anderson coming back? We don't know. When is he coming back? We'll see Campbell in tonight. He's kind of like balsa wood. You never know when it's going to break. So I'm hoping that uh, they address that, and we'll talk more about that. Jordan, thank you, buddy. Really thank look you. forward to, to uh, working with you. You've done a great job. And, of course, we will see you tomorrow on Lunch with Gooch Live. Uh, Gooch and friends at noon. And then at 4 o'clock, the Rosen Report. Good night, everybody. Have a good night. You've been listening to Gooch Live with your host, Kerry Goulet, better known as The Gooch, brought to you by the Hockey News and Sports Illustrated. 